Assalamu alaikum. Um, welcome to the webinar entitled Economic Diversification and Digital Technologies, organized by the Riyadh Economic Forum and the Think 20 in September 2020. My name is uh, Khaled Al Saeed, member of the Board of Trustees of Riyadh Economic Forum. Um, we are delighted to have you today. The structure of the presentation will be as followed. We will get an overview of the role of the T20 and the journey uh, that has started uh, for the year 2020 in Saudi Arabia and this uh, and its partnership with King Abdullah Petroleum uh, Studies and uh, Research Center, CAPSARC, by Mr. Abdul Ilah Darandari. We will then uh, listen to uh, Mr. Carlos Braga, Associate Professor at uh, Fanda, Fanda Cao, Dam Cabral and a co-author of the Task Force One on uh, title, the paper, Trade, Investment, and Growth, Diversification, and the World Trading System. Uh, and then we will be hearing from Mr. Uh, Nujogana Nudongo, Executive Director of the African Economic Research Consortium in Kenya, and a task force member under the title of Africa Diversification and its Trade Policy Transformation. And the last but not least, we will hear from Mr. Uh, Matthew Stephenson, uh, policy and community lead within the international trade and investment from the World Economic Forum on how the G20 can uh, advance uh, sustainable and digital investment. After that, we will be opening the floor for uh, questions from the, our dear audience, and they could either email or send a, a, a voice note. Uh, Mr. Abdelilah Garandari, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Khalid Al Saeed. Uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to the Riyadh Economic Webinar Series co-hosted co -hosted with the T20. My name is Abdelilah Garandari. I'm an economic researcher at the King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center. I also represent the T20's Trade, Investment and Growth Task Force as both a co-author as well as a coordinator of the task force. Today's session is extremely relevant for all of us, covering economic diversification and sustainable digital investments. The discussions that will be held today are based on four T20 Saudi Arabia policy briefs, which were a result of a long process of collaboration of rich intellectual vigor that founded 10 policy briefs within the T20's task force under the leadership of our lead co-chair, Dr. Saeed al-Sheikh. As a co-author of diversification policy briefs, I would like to share with you some thoughts on the subject. Economic diversification is critical for developing countries to create jobs and foster structural transformation away from single sector dependence. Many economies around the world strive to diversify their economies, whether it may be in the form of increasing local content or export diversification. However, to achieve a diversification, Countries must embark on a wide range of initiatives coordinated by policymakers and regulators that leverage local and global efforts to promote achievable diversification paths. Concurrently doing so, while also considering the rapid and fierce global competitive landscape, the constraints of world trade rules and agreements, solving local bottlenecks, attract sustainable investment flows in a manner that reduces the impact on the environment is no easy task. In addition, diversification helps promote economic stability in developing nations, improves welfare, welfare, and lowers uncertainty, ultimately improving the investment climate. The comparative advantage narrative has shrouded many possibilities. Now with advancement in technologies and refined digital infrastructure, there is much opportunity to be seized by developing economies. Yet the legislating bodies governing trade system for years has protected certain industries and nations, has set up barriers to diversify, and these must be addressed to ensure fairness to realize prosperity for developing nations. The inclusion of developing economies in the global value chain offers huge opportunity that is a win-win for all. This is especially true for the Middle East and North Africa region, and is it a strategic trade route access through several continents for many markets for access. Again, thank you for being with us today, and back to our moderator, Dr. Khalid Saeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abdelila. Um, so uh, I, um, I was pleased to get the opportunity and the chance to go over the policy briefs. And I have to say that most of the 
findings in, are in line with the global outlook as we see some global economic uncertainties due to the great lockdown, due to, due to the pandemic, global trade tension and volatility in oil prices. Um, as the policy report acknowledges the serious challenges, uh, these reports come with uh, many very good policy recommendations to boost economic growth. That's why these policy reports are really very unique. Um, also, they generate jobs by emphasizing the, they, they help to generate jobs by emphasizing the significance of investing in human capital development and by focusing on the quality of education, enabling small and medium enterprises uh, by providing many different initiatives such as access to funding and financial services. However, the challenges in, uh, is in implementing these recommendations, especially in vulnerable regions such as the uh, MENA and the Africa and Africa, emphasizing the quality of education. Um, reflecting on the uh, briefs papers, Riyadh Economic Forum perspective guided by the Saudi Arabian Vision 2030 believes that education and talent development are the key drivers of the economy. And we believe that the success of SMEs is a critical factor of a healthy economy by creating a suitable um, ecosystem with a fit for purpose legal and regulatory frameworks and attracting cutting edge technologies from global and regional educational institutions. At this point, I will leave it uh, there uh, for our distinguished speaker to elaborate on their papers. We will start with our uh, distinguished speaker, Mr. Carlos Braga, Associate Professor at the uh, Fonducao Don uh, Cabral and co-author of Task Force One. Um, Mr. Carlos, the, flo the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Khalid, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all. I'm speaking uh, about Policy Brief 8, where we focus on the issue of uh, diversification and the world trading system. So, the key question that we try to analyze is the issue of how export diversification is affected by trade policies, including multilateral rules, regional trade agreements, and national measures. And uh, as Dr. Khalid pointed out, of course, there is a bigger paper uh, where we go into the details, and one of the main messages is exactly the importance of education in the process of diversification particularly in developing economies, but all over the world. So the main messages of this report, and Dr. Khalid, I don't know if you are trying to show the slides, but uh, but I can continue without the slides, that's fine. Uh, I already, yes, um, uh, Mr. Braga, I already enabled you to, to share your slides. Okay. So it will take me a second here. So can you see the slides? Yes, very clear. Thank you. Okay. So. I just mentioned what is the key question that we try to address. And uh, the messages, just to emphasize, is that uh, export diversification, particularly for lower income countries, tends to reduce the volatility associated with the exports of primary commodities. And diversification is also associated with economic growth, but it's important to understand that it's not necessarily a driver of economic growth. It's better to think about diversification uh, and growth as jointly determined by sound economic fundamentals, including good gover governance. Uh, rich nations historically diversified initially from agriculture to manufacturing, but this track it's much more complex nowadays because of increased 
international competition, because of automation, and all of this, of course, doesn't mean that this trajectory cannot be pursued, but diversification often requires that we explore specific niches. Uh, and in this context, particularly with respect to global value chains, small and medium enterprise have a very important role. The same goes with respect to foreign direct investment. So the bottom line is that uh, although most countries would benefit from export diversification, the world trading system is not very supportive of diversification at present, particularly because of barriers to trade that still exist, particularly with respect to agriculture. So policymakers often think of export diversification as a shift from agriculture to manufacturing. We in these papers have adopted a broader perspective that is diversification within sectors and across all sectors. In other words, we are also interested in diversification within agriculture, mining, services, etc. And we used some analysis based on the Tayo index, which is one index of economic concentration, looking how the world economy uh, evolved uh, between 19, the, the decade of 1960 and 2014. And the diversification process typically occurs in two main ways. One is by achieving a more balanced set of product markets in existing product markets, the intensive margin, or by entering new product markets, uh, in other words, the extensive margin. So here we have a picture of how the Tayo index, which is an index of concentration that typically ranges from two to eight, and the lower the index, typically more diversified is the economy. You can see that the industrialized countries have become much more diversified over the 60s, 70s. More recently, however, the diversification has declined a little bit to the extent that we enter a period characterized by expansion of global value chains and fragmentation of production. But it's still, if we look at the index, these economies have a very diversified uh, export portfolio. Now, if you look at different regions here, beginning with the Middle East, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, you can see that these are the regions that are less diversified. Once again, the higher the index, the less diversified is the economy. Latin America has evolved uh, to significant diversification, but this process has more or less stalled in the last few decades, in part because of the commodity super cycle of the first decade of this millennium. Now, the two regions that uh, have achieved most diversification among developing regions are exactly East Asia, China here playing a very important role, and Eastern Europe uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the integration of Eastern European countries, uh, most of them becoming market economies, uh, you saw a significant diversification of these economies. So this is one way to look at the process of diversification. Another dimension of diversification is the issue of upgrading. Uh, if you get higher export unit values, more value added in your uh, portfolio of exports. Uh, you can see, of course, that advanced economies have a much more, let's say, intensive quality uh, index than developing countries. No surprise here. Once again, emerging Europe and lack have significantly increased uh, the quality of their exports. I'm speaking to you from São José dos Campos in Brazil, 
which is uh, the home of the head offices and the main uh, factory of Embraer, the third largest aircraft producer in the world. So although Brazil is perceived mainly as a commodity exporter, it has achieved some positive results in terms of uh, uh, high-tech exports like aeronautics. But overall, we can see that the performance of developing countries has been mainly on the extensive, uh, uh, on the intensive margin, meaning it's mainly being driven by the dramatic growth of China and the commodity super cycle of the last three decades. Now, the performance on the extensive margin, new products and quality upgrading has been weak in this context is a sign that the diversification did not reflect a profound structural transformation in most developing economies. Now, what are the barriers to diversification? You can see that the agricultural sector is the one that faces typically more significant tariff barriers compared to the rest of other products, uh, be it from the point of view of the average dude faced on exports or even in the context of domestic production. So agriculture typically is a sector significantly uh, protect through high tariffs, tariff peaks, uh, TRQs, also the imposition of sanitary and phytosanitary uh, requirements that often are very uh, demanding from the point of view of developing countries, and last but not least, subsidies that in many OECD countries are quite significant and of course uh, characterize a barrier for these markets to be contested by exports from developing countries. And if we go now to manufacturing, you can see, and here we have both uh, the MFN, the most favored nation weighted average of tariffs on consumer goods, intermediate goods, raw materials, and capital goods. And as you can see, there is a significant uh, tariff escalation particularly the effective rate of protection for consumer goods is much higher than what the average tariff shows because you have much higher, uh, much higher tariffs on consumer goods, but the inputs like intermediate goods, raw materials and capital goods face much lower tariffs. So the effective rate of protection is very high and in this context is another barrier for countries to explore, developing countries in particular, their competitive advantage in this area. Now, uh, the other value that appears in this uh, slide is uh, the, the applied weighted average using the harmonized system. And as you can see, the applied the tariff rates are smaller than the MFN rates. This reflects uh, the expansion of preferential trade agreements over the last few decades. But we have to remember that even if apply the picture using applied interest rates is not as dramatic as using MFN rates, they come together with significant uh, issues like, for instance, very restrictive rules of origin. And all of this translates in a picture that you can see that exactly those segments of the economy, like agriculture, textile and clothing, fruitware, where developing countries typically have comparative advantages, are the ones that face uh, more significant barriers to trade. If we move now very quickly to the situation of services, and here we see that services have had a very important role over the last few years, uh, not only because they are intrinsically linked, uh, the expansion of commercial services like transportation, but also information technology related services, they are very much linked to the expansion 
of global value chains, the most dynamic component of international trade over the last few decades. But they also face significant uh, barriers, particularly in the, in the regulatory area. And these are becoming even more, let's say, critical in terms of the future of the world trading system as we see advances in telecommunications like 5G technology, the role of artificial intelligence, how this is going to reshape the role of service in the world economy. Needless to say, COVID-19 has brought new challenges for services industries. We didn't address this in the paper, but we can discuss during the Q&A period. As I already mentioned, we have significant barriers to trade and services, particularly in the context of regulation, but restrictions on foreign entry and restrictions on the movement of people are areas where there is a significant potential for uh, diversification by developing countries in the context of commercial service. So to conclude, the policy recommendations, they are let's say, quite uh, conventional in the context of what uh, economic theory suggests. We should reduce and eliminate tariff escalation, tariff peaks uh, that constrain uh, value addition in both agriculture and manufacturing sectors, in particular in products of interest to developing countries. We should uh, also strengthen and update uh, trade uh, the rules to tackle trade distort and subsidies. In this context, the WTO can play a very important role if negotiations are restarted with respect to agriculture. We should tighten disciplines on export restrictions and export taxes. We should explore, maybe on a plurilateral basis, a new round of services trade liberalization. We should address the need for better rules on investment facilitation to streamline uh, investments, foster transparency, and also to improve the implementation of domestic regulations. And of course, the whole issue of digital commerce needs a special attention, something that we are going to hear more in the paper from Matthew later on. And last but not least, once again, the importance of small and medium enterprise, and in this context, the role of aid for trade can play in this context with respect to developing countries. Now, <clears throat> it's important to recognize that it's not only a question at the level of the multilateral trade systems and the rules of uh, trade at a multilateral level. Many of the issues are problems at national level that could be addressed through trade liberalization in an effective manner, particularly revisiting non-tariff me measures, reducing high costs of exporting, liberalizing trade and services, adopting an investment-friendly regime, and once again, a legal framework conducive to digital trade. So I will stop here and I'll be glad to take questions uh, during the Q&A period. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Braga, for a very rich uh, uh, presentation. If you just allow me, I will just uh, quickly recap on your wonderful presentation just to maximize the value of such great work. Uh, the key challenges are, number one, uh, export diversifications have shown uh, little progress and have been declined in most countries, especially in the Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East and North Africa and Latin America. Number two of the challenges over the last three years, the trend has been toward more impediments to diversification, not to less. Number three, major trade dis distortion continues. These are the challenges and for the policy recommendations for the G20 and WTO partnership, they should really reinforce non-discrimination principles, reducing and eliminating tariff escalations, tariff peaks, and high tariffs. 
Number three, strengthening and updating rules to tackle trade distorting subsidies. Number four, limiting export restrictions and export taxes and natural resources to avoid the disruption of global supply chains. Going back on the national trade policies, reducing or eliminating tariffs on raw materials, inputs and capital equipment to facilitate integration into global and regional value chains and to foster technology transfer. I hope this captured this captures it, Mr. Braga. Very good. Thank you so much. And now uh, we go to um, Dr. Uh, Saeed Sheikh, uh, our um, uh, second speaker, and and he will be uh, speaking about the economic diversification in the Middle East and um, uh, North Africa region. Um, Dr. Saeed, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khalid, uh, and I'm waiting for you to enable the presentation, please. Yes, I did already. Um, so should I click on show my screen? Is that the yes. sign? For yes. Do you see my slides? Yes, and we can see them. Yes. All right. So the uh, this policy brief is focusing on diversification in, in MENA region. And uh, what you see in this uh, first page is just the contributor to uh, this uh, policy briefs, uh, the list of contributors. Uh, my remarks will be divided in three segments. I will start, first of all, highlighting the challenges. And then I'll talk about the proposal. And there are four, five elements in the proposal. And then the last section of the presentation will be on policy diversification or uh, the, the recommended policies. Uh, and these recommended policies will be derived basically from the proposal. So I'll start with the uh, challenges that are facing the MENA region. As you know, the region is characterized by an excessive reliance on raw materials exports for foreign exchange earnings, as well as that the region depend on foreign markets for industrial and food uh, products. However, these dependencies uh, made the region susceptible to volatility when it comes to growth and also led to unemployment or high unemployment levels among the youth. Uh, the region also is characterized by the dominance of a single energy system, uh, given the heavy reliance on oil and gas. And obviously, this brings an environmental burden in some of the countries. Uh, overcoming these challenges obviously going to be through diversifications and diversification you know had been attempted within the region but not necessarily producing the desirable uh, results. Uh, so comparative advantage was not necessarily the only thing that would help in promoting diversification but economic reforms, availability of human resources or skilled human resources uh, are important. Macroeconomic stability are also crucial aspects that are needed to achieve diversification. The proposal is building on these concepts that I just highlighted, and it will be divided here in this presentation in five segments. Uh, first of all, is the role of trade in accelerating structural transformation, as had been pointed by the first speaker, Mr. Carlos Braga, and the role of trade. Uh, obviously, trade will help in accelerating the transition, 
um, several studies in different parts of the world, as had been as had been in the advanced economies that facilitated surplus production and improved productivity. Also, you know, trade would require, you know, lowering the trans transportation costs, especially within the region, in order to expand trade and allow for the process structural transformation. Uh, the uh, implementation of structural reform to improve macroeconomic uh, performance uh, had been attempted, like I said, but there are certainly, uh, you know, rooted problems within the region uh, that comes from within the governance uh, or institutional aspects that had not been addressed fully. So this is the first aspect in the proposal. The second one is the trade agreements and global value chain. The region had attempted, of course, to build trade relations with the rest of the world. And there is the MENA OECD initiative. Wow. And the aim was to facilitate cooperation between these two regions and promote policies of sustainable and inclusive growth. However, the performance or the results derived from such an initiative had been below expectation. In fact, some studies through the gravity model pointed out that, you know, given the size of these regions and given the proximity between these two regions, the level of trade volume could be 3.5 to four times the current level. There are also uh, uh, preferential agreements that have been done between within the MENA region, the Pan-Arab Free Trade Area, also Agadir agreement, and was the purpose to remove tariffs. But the fact that, you know, logistics and lack of transparency and bureaucracy had not helped in promoting trade. And this requires, of course, you know, reforming or acting on, you know, uh, making use of such uh, agreements. The uh, third element is the human development, technology, transfer, and digital technologies. And it had been pointed by the first speaker, the role of, you know, human skills and its relevance. Uh, because if you're tapping into high level uh, and technology uh, production, obviously the human skills need to be enhanced and improved, and which would require the improving of the educational system uh, and also, uh, you know, develop uh, the skills, uh, promote innovations, uh, uh, build the information structures, these are essential. And uh, in addition, the region need to expand the FDI beyond the current level that is focused or largely in, you know, petrochemical uh, and gas and oil, which are the advantage of this region to a high value added products uh, and uh, be part of the global value chain in order to develop you know, high value added sectors that would allow for uh, diversifications. The fourth element in the proposal is the entrepreneurial culture, culture in the region. With the startups within the region face tremendous difficulties, um, whether related to the legal environment, the business environment is not maturing enough. Also the funding issues and there are no, you know, um, uh, the significant or sizable and, um, uh, funds that would not only pro provide the fund, but also uh, provide the mentoring and uh, access to knowledge and guiding that will help uh, entrepreneurs. So there is a lack of that culture that would promote the uh, uh, startup ecosystem. 
The uh, fifth point here is the methodology. Okay, we know all of this. Now, how do we uh, trace the effect of the policies uh, that would promote diversification and measure the success uh, over time? And the methodology that is proposed here in this policy brief is, is the input-output framework. Uh, this has been documented in different places in the world on how to uh, measure the linkages between the different sectors of the economy, and at the same time, uh, measure the, the impact of different policies on the changes that would take place in the economic structure, and how to guide policies as well as channel funding in the sectors that would lead to the largest impact in terms of economic transition. So this is also as an aspect that had been dealt with in this uh, policy brief. The, uh, now I'm moving to the third part of my presentation, and I will start with the policy recommendation one, and these policies are derived basically from those five elements in the proposal. And the first policy recommendation is that G20 should support MENA policymakers in their quest to enhance the integration of their economies into the global economy and take advantage of global value chain, especially in technology sectors through creation of new transport paths to facilitate access to foreign markets. And this obviously will address the aspects that we've talked about regarding the limited scope of uh, investment for investment region that had been only in oil and gas sectors, but to go into the high value added products and services such as electronics, electrical equipments, green energy, pharmaceutical, financial services, and so on, in order to uh, be part of this global value change and the production of processes. Uh, policy recommendation two is mainly related to the region itself and the regional G20 countries together with major active trading partners. So we're talking about the Saudi Arabia and Turkey, for example, as G20 uh, members of the G20, uh, they should uh, expand and explore and accelerate trading opportunities and remove trade constraints within uh, the region. And obviously this will tackle the problems that are existing within the region, either related to governance or institutional aspects that limit uh, the benefits of trade agreements and create barriers to trade within uh, the region. The third policy brief related to the entrepreneurial culture that I was talking about and the importance of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And here, the G20 should provide the technical support in establishing a mean of startup evolution council to create an enabling entrepreneurship ecosystem within the region, which ultimately enhance MENA uh, G20 trade and cooperation. This will allow, of course, for further trade to be taking place once that entrepreneurial culture is developed and businesses and small businesses grow up and become part of the global value change that will encourage trade between and promote trade between the region and the G20 members. So to the benefits of both uh, parties. Uh, the fourth policy brief is uh, focusing on the efforts, uh, how to effectively implement bilateral and regional trade agreements and to engage in economic and legal reforms that will improve MENA countries' business competitiveness indicators. This is important for uh, removing the obstacles between the regions between countries within the region, and also their competitiveness would improve, and that would allow for more foreign investment to the region as 
the competitiveness indicators of the region improve. Uh, the fifth policy brief is focusing on the education and MENA policymakers must improve the educational system outcomes to provide the skill labor force and target high value added technology transfer in order to stimulate innovation and uh, especially in emergent and high value added non-energy sectors. And this obviously, this policy will address the existing gap when it comes to knowledge economy, the uh, education and information infrastructure, uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, the sixth policy brief that many countries must improve the business climate and facilitate international trade through transport, efficient, digital, and innovative procedures supported by state-of-art logistics infrastructure, airports, seaports, and railroad systems. So the taking advantage and accessing uh, technology, and especially now with the rise of the fourth industrial revolution, will uh, allow the region to build uh, its infrastructure capacity uh, for an, for an economy that would be able to absorb knowledge, acquire skills and transfer technology and diffuse uh, innovation. Uh, the last one, the last policy brief is addressing the methodology uh, as I highlighted in the proposal and basically for the countries of the region to explore the use of input output framework to identify the proper uh, diversification strategy that will be most suited to each country in delivering sustainable economic growth and job uh, creation. And um, without knowing and being able to measure the impact of the different policies, uh, there will be no possibility for being able to revisit and correct the chosen past and obviously, that's why we believe that it is important for countries within the region to implement a set of methodology, but we thought that the input output framework would provide a more useful tool, given the linkages that are existing between the different sectors of the economy and being able to measure uh, the linkages and the impact of the changes in policies, not only at a one point in time, but even over time and being able to revisit policies and choose the right path that will generate the largest impact in terms of diversification and in terms of job creation. With that, I conclude my presentation and thank you, Dr. Khaled. Thank you very thank much, you. Dr. Saeed, for the uh, thorough presentation. Uh, please allow me to uh, recap on some of the wonderful uh, points you've uh, highlighted. On the key challenges observed, number one, there's deficiency in diversification efforts. Number two, dominance of public enterprise. Number three, there's insufficient entrepreneurship. Number four, there's a gap in human capital innovation. Number five, there's this dysfunctional job market. Number six, there's imperfect, imperfect financial development. Number seven, there's uh, the ratio of domestic private sector bank credit to GDP in the MENA is low at about 44% in 2014 compare, compared to the, uh, East, uh, 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 to the uh, East and Pacific Asia, 122%, and to Europe and Central Asia, 99%. That's for the key challenges. On the policy recommendations, um, your recommendations are that the G20 and MENA should enhance trade, trade cooperation. That's number one. Number two, they should focus on their effort on how to effectively execute bilateral and regional trade agreements. Number three, improve their own educational systems to provide information technology labor force for the future. Number five, improve regional business climates by transforming the cross-border clearance ecosystem through, uh, uh, transparent, through transparency. Number six, uh, startups will play a key role in the economic transformation of the MENA region. Dr. Saeed, that, would that capture it all? 
Yes, thank you very much. Well done. Thank you very much. Uh, and the, our next speaker is Mr. Uh, Najugana uh, Nodongo. Uh, he is the Executive Director of uh, African Economic Research Consortium in Kenya and member of the uh, task force. And the, the title is Africa's Diversification and um, uh, uh, its Trade Policy Transformation. Um, um, Mr. Uh, Dongo, uh, let me hand it over to you. And uh, now uh, you are the speaker. The floor Thank is you. yours. Thank you so much. And um, have you allowed me to make uh, uh, share the screen? Uh, I don't know. Can you hear me? Have you allowed to yes, show my show? Oh, okay, and then I will go to show my screen. Is that, can you manage to see my screen? Not yet. Oh, okay, I don't know. Audience. Uh, is it is it okay now? No, it's... Um, yes, yes, thank you. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And um, let me start from let me start from the very beginning. And uh, let me uh, let me put it in slideshow. Something that um, uh, I like doing. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. I think uh, I've listened to fantastic presentations, and I hope uh, and I, I hope this one uh, from uh, the African setting, especially sub-Saharan African setting, is that you're going to provide us with. Um, Again, something that complements what has been presented. And I like very much uh, Carol's presentation showing that actually it is the agricultural sector that suffers uh, mostly in Africa. And that is the concentration of uh, the, 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 this paper. Coming from the African Economic Research Consortium, where we, we are capacity building a network for policy analysis and even uh, capability, this is very, very important. Let me start by the conclusion. The conclusion on, in this policy brief shows that uh, global value chain restructuring and even reforms in trade policies, as well as reforms in non-trade barriers can actually improve trade. And that can open up channels of economic diversification. And that is a very uh, important conclusion because it has four assets on it. First, it open, opens in, uh, investment opportunities. And this is consistent, to, it's a political economy issue because if incomes, if uh, economic rent for a particular sector is actually invested, it's going to open up opportunities for investment. But it will also improve the investment crime. And it will also promote inclusiveness. But finally, and more importantly, it's going to support uh, market entry. So I wanted just to start with such a, a conclusion because for me, it's very, very, very critical. The, paper, the brief starts with the challenge. There are two challenges. One of them is that the international development challenge for the G20 and the African bloc is actually to leverage the African continent of free trade area for a win-win G20 African economic interdependencies and even to boost the Africa G20 cooperation. There are several aspects of this. One of them is increasing trade. The other one is promoting intra-regional trade, especially in Africa. And of course, as I actually have argued, it is the reinvestment in these sectors that actually constrain them to become small in, in, the, in the region, in this African region where I come from, most of the uh, smallholder farmers have been smallholder farmers since the 50s, since the 60s, after the corona, after colonization. And the, the third point is that it's going to facilitate diversification and economic transformation because trade and uh, even global value chain, uh, chain restructuring are very, very critical in terms of providing this incentive. We do believe that the African uh, continental free trade area will address a range of interrelated policies for African economies. First, intra-African trade liberalization is actually very, very important. Second, in the long run, enabling diversification of economic activity is actually driven by actually the opportunities and the, and the innovativeness in the market. And that is how it also allows entry into the global markets because complex production structures as well as competitive production is very, very critical. And finally, the transmission that is we are really looking at and even we are addressing from especially the study by AERC on, uh, on the continental free trade area 
is actually going to support or even to help mitigate volatility because most of the agricultural uh, production processes are actually uh, uh, doomed by volatility. In actually, in actual fact, most of the time we talk about uh, fragility of their production processes. And this is the path towards sustainable growth and development. And we do believe that the agenda for Africa 2063 would be very, very critical when we come to uh, such, um, such programs. Um, the second challenge is actually uh, th that uh, would like to have perhaps the thrust of uh, Africa's diversification strategy and trade policy transformation. And we would like to see how do they uh, marry each other with that, uh, the aspects of economic growth and even stability, and how it is going to deepen G20 Africa economic inter interdependencies. And here, we would like to actually look at the continental free trade, trade, uh, trade uh, uh, as a vehicle for speeding economic transformation. And there are several aspects within that. And I think uh, even there has been a mention of for the industrial revolution, because essentially as we move to the digital space and even the industrial revolution, it is a question of product diversification, competitive production, and even restructuring the global value chain that is going to create the endogenous mechanism for growth. The second, it, the out, uh, it is important to outline the role of G20 and African countries in terms of leveraging this endeavor. And this is both in terms of collective legitimate governance, as well as G20's effort towards global, global rebalancing to promote capital flows from surplus countries to opportunities in sustainable infrastructure and climate change. In Africa, and every time we talk about it, is that infrastructure gap itself imposes very heavy transactions cost to production processes. So it's, in a sense, it is the, the, the endogenous effects of uh, the restructuring of the global value chain that can create those incomes to, and, and that will enable that restructuring. We, and the second point is that we need to reshape the future trade relations between G20 members and the African economies. And of course, these are issues that have already been, uh, been, been talked about. But I do believe that at the end of the day, what we are looking at is actually economic transformation and um, the economic, economic diversification that is going actually to allow for the uh, for the diversification of the of of, uh, of of the economies. Now, they are, having said that, then what are the propositions for the G20? First, we started by talking about promoting African continental free trade area and the implementation of that. And uh, how does this work? One of them is boosting financial and technical support to building capacities in African member states. I do believe for us, we build capacity so that the capacities we build can actually find itself in in in, in, uh, in government. And once it is in government, we know that we can actually improve the space and even the institutional, institutional capability for implementing policies that are well thought out. The second one is investment in physical infrastructure. I've already talked about this, but it keeps coming. But for me, I also look at it in terms of the G20 countries can actually invest. These are high returns. In, uh, investment in infrastructure has high returns. If you want to see an example, is for example the Eurobond and how it has really been com uh, competitive in terms of trading. But what are the what 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 are the proceeds of Eurobond being used used for? In most countries, it is being used to close the infrastructure gap. The third one is facilitating trade by more strongly orienting G20 expertise and aid programs towards trade facilitation in Africa and potentially substitute revenue losses. And these are commonplace issues, but of course they require more debate. So I didn't want to overcrowd the, the, the presentation with the debate. Then the, the second one is security trade policies and broadening existing partnerships. And there are key actions here. One of them is spearheading the world trading system reforms that will promote diversification of exports and even trade related support to African countries. And the second one is capacity development with respect to African trade policies. And this is important to address, especially the concerns of our G20 protectionist uh, policies and even tariffs. So many years back, we used to talk about even um, the, the concept of uh, value addition, the concept of uh, domestic value addition and the percentage of which was actually like a protection, pro protectionist to the industries.
The third one is maintaining and, extend, uh, and, and extending the existing preferential trade measures and um, aid for trade assurance in, in, in the entire continent. And of course, these are issues that have been mentioned and uh, come before. And the economic partnership agreements are very, very critical because in a, in a sense, that is what is going to help the weaker countries are here to enter into the markets and to sustain their entry in terms of following the ground rules. And finally, strengthening innovative trade and investment partnership with, with Africa's main, uh, main external trading partners. And this is critical in terms of the trading partners, but more importantly, even for the where we have emerging economies, would like an entry point which diversifies uh, the, 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 the critical, should I say, benefits of uh, competitive production of exports. Then, of course, we also have the proposal of economic uh, diversification and integration into regional market and even the global value chains. The strategies here should be adopted by the African bro, but also support from the G20 and the private sectors. And the first one is actually to develop and implement a harmonized technical standards or custom procedures. This is an issue that has come up in so many of the trade studies I've seen or even discussions. But the bottom line is we need to get to work in terms of how can it be done? And maybe this brief is just a background so that at least behind it, we can actually develop um, uh, avenues in terms of how it can be done. And the second one is to review and improve the G20 uh, trade policies. And this has come up in several cases, but what we would like to do is actually to increase Afri Africa's export entry and even capability and even improving competitiveness at the production, uh, at the production level. And uh, obviously capacities and capabilities are important, but of course, uh, rationalization of uh, non-tariff uh, measures is always very, very critical. And third, Africa should adopt an international accepted trade facilitation standard, such as uh, w w which are well uh, articulated. And of course, this is where strengthening the capability of the African institutions and even uh, uh, production processes is very, very important. Uh, the, 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 the next one is about economic diversification and what happens at the regional and global value chain. And the, I'm looking at it in terms of the G20 being a catalytic guide, which is going to allow upgrading of production, of, uh, of, of production. And this is where infrastructure and technical expertise to raise quality uh, is going to be very, very important. And then investment in research and development and this is where, of course, with the digital, uh, with the fourth industrial revolution that is coming up, it's a question of how innovations can actually propel the works in this area. And then strengthening institution capacities to enforce product quality. And this is an area that has been with African economies for, for many years. But unfortunately, it starts, it, it, it can start, it cannot start from production processes. It has to start with what are the returns on. The investments that have already been made and that is that is where the global value chain becomes very important and um, finally the g20 and the partnership ought to prioritize the strategies for engagement with the private sector the africa's private sector is very very critical but of course it is driven by the, the investment climate or even the policy environment that is there it's also driven by the institutional capability an institutional failure problem will always lead to a market failure problem and that's what we have seen and that is why partnership itself creates a, creates a catalytic effort to actually improve institutional capability as well as policy environment. Now, so uh, sorry, I, I've moved so fast, but uh, the most important thing, as I said from the very beginning, is that we have to reverse the law and talk about global value chain can create an incentive for institutional reforms. And those institutional reforms can push trade reforms in the African setting itself and then give it a room to actually move to the G20 relationship. And that is the critical message for this policy brief. Thank you very much uh, for listening to me. Thank you very much, Mr. Nadango. Uh, this uh, very wonderful, enlightening presentation, especially on the recently established African continental free trade area. Uh, let me please just recap quickly the challenges observed, and then we will go to the policy recommendations. Um, uh, challenges uh, uh, observed are the number one, the recently established African continental free trade area brings benefits, but also risks and challenges 
including policy and procedural constraints that might create bottlenecks at the regional level. Number two, the African uh, uh, continental free trade area, once realized, is expected to become the largest trade integration project in the world in terms of participating countries since the formation of the World Trade Organization. However, the implementation of this large group will be challenging across 54 African member states. Number three, Africa st uh, Africa's share in total world exports and imports has not grown in the last two decades, averaging only 2.7% for both exports and imports. For the policy recommendations, number one, Africa, the G20 should cooperate uh, on limiting a few single initiatives and observe status for African Union and new uh, uh, partnership, partnership, partnership for Africa's development. This level of engagement should be enhanced to focus on the current global challenges and strong economic interdependence between Africa and G20 countries. Number two, the G20 countries should promote the implementation of the African continental free trade area and thereby strengthening intercontinental trade flows. Number three, the G20 could support and leverage the potential of the African continental free trade areas by influencing its members' trade policies and broadening trade partnership with Africa. I hope this captures it all. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we go to um, Matthew Stevenson, Policy and Community Lead in the International Trade and Investment from the World Economic Forum, uh, entitled "How the G20," uh, titled "How the G20 Can Advance Sustainable and Digital Investment." Um, and uh, Stevenson. Um, Mr. Stevenson, the, um, the microphone is yours. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Khalid. And um, I see the option to show my screen. So let me yes. do that. I will try not to show at the same time the notes that I'm planning to read from. So you won't see that. Let's see. Oh, nice. um, do you see my screen, gentlemen? Yes. Yes. I will just move this. Okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, say thank you to the organizers for the chance to speak today. I really appreciate the invitation, especially to be in such an august uh, gathering. I uh, feel lucky to be following the presentations of uh, Mr. Carlos Primograga, uh, Dr. Said, Mr. Njuguna. Um, let me tell you why for a second. Uh, I think many of the things they mentioned are things that we pick up on in our policy briefs. And I congratulate the organizers for putting us together in, in this panel. Uh, Dr. Braga talked about the role of 5G and AI in reshaping trade and services and the investment needed in, in those areas. Um, then Dr. Said talked about the uh, startup culture and ecosystem for entrepreneurship that is needed for diversification. And um, uh, Dr. Ujuguna talked about investment in physical infrastructure, the need for technical standards to be harmonized and incentives. And these are all things that I think we mentioned in various ways in our policy brief. And so these, these issues are coming together. I, I remember traveling to the kingdom, Saudi Arabia, three times while working for the World Bank and very much working on the issues of economic diversification through investment, investment policy reforms. At that time, the, the focus of the conversation was on inward investment and outward investment and how the, both could be used for economic diversification. Today, I'd like to add two other dimensions uh, to that conversation, which are captured in our policy brief. Our policy brief is entitled, How the G20 Can Support Sustainable and Digital Investment. And I'd like to argue today that uh, there are levers, specific measures to do with sustainable investment and specific le levers, measures to do with digital investment, digital FDI, that can also support uh, and accelerate economic diversification. So with that, 
um, allow me to, to tell you why. Um, the World Economic Forum has launched a, um, a new initiative called Digital FDI, which aims to create regulatory frameworks that um, are attractive to digital investment. And this is one mechanism in which uh, the digital investment can drive uh, diversification. So what is the framework that we're using to try to identify the top policies and uh, measures that can be used uh, to attract digital investment, digital FDI? We are using um, this framework here that you see uh, on slide three, where we see digital investment as really supported by three different uh, pillars. It's a conceptual framework that UNCTAD developed um, in their 2017 uh, World Investment Report. And it suggests that digital investment uh, can be understood as falling into three pillars, enabling investment in existing uh, digital activities um, in the form of uh, digital firms like Uber, enabling investment in uh, new activities by traditional firms such as telemedicine or mobile banking that did not exist before, and finally, the infrastructure that is useful to underpin those enable the investment in digital infrastructure. So to answer the question of what are the most important policies and measures to attract digital investment in these three different pillars, we ran a global survey of 310 uh, executives. And um, in this global survey, we asked them to rank what would they need to see in terms of policies and measures in these three different pillars if their firm was to invest in the digital economy. And so today I'd like to share with you some of the results of that global survey. I think it can create a roadmap for um, some of the reforms and some of the interventions that might be useful to leverage digital investment for diversification by growing the digital economy. So first in the area of investing in digital firms. So these are the Ubers of this world. These are new digital firms. Uh, the top policy concern and the that was identified was data security regulations. Following that, after that came uh, copyright laws to protect intellectual property and then data privacy regulations. Now, in terms of digital uh, adoption by traditional non-digital firms, so these are the telemedicines and the mobile banking services that can be increasingly provided, be provided the top policy uh, concern, the top uh, enabler was e-payment services. After that, in our global survey, came support for starting digital businesses and support for local digital skills development. Uh, here you see on the screen some of these results. And then in the third pillar, uh, when considering investing in digital infrastructure, the first um, the priority that investors were telling us, executives from around the world, was the ease of receiving licenses. This was the most important thing they needed to see if they were interested in investing in the digital economy uh, in other jurisdictions. After that would be the availability of skilled local engineers and other workers. And then tied for third place, two different uh, elements, the use of international standards, Dr. Nguna uh, mentioned, and uh, regional coordination for infrastructure investment. And so, um, these, what we've uncovered at the global level, I would say, can provide what would be called a roadmap, um, a roadmap for some of the reforms and policy interventions uh, to support digital investments, contribution for diversification, and for, in fact, greater resilience and growth given the digital transformation that is taking place more broadly. Uh, but at the same time, it's important to take the results from the global level and realize that each economy is going to be at a different starting point. Each uh, economy will have different comparative advantages in terms of its current digital uh, setup and also potentially different goals, um, different strengths that it wishes to develop as for its national development strategy. So, um, what we suggest is that uh, economies need to take this, this global framework, this global thinking in terms of what investors are saying are the priorities to invest in the digital economy, and then land it 
within a national reform agenda. Uh, and this would take place uh, through four steps. First of all, a diagnostic step to understand in that particular economy, what uh, is the current context? What are the strengths and weaknesses in terms of the digital economy? And what, what might be needed to address those? Then a targeted survey step, uh, asking investors, what would they need to see in that country or in that region to invest in the digital economy, given that different uh, economies may have different interests for investors, whether it is the economic size, uh, level of income, revenue, skills, resources, geography, location, and so forth. And then developing and fine tuning uh, recommendations that are targeted to that economy on the basis of steps one and two, and finally implementing those. So what I've laid out a little bit is, um, is a roadmap for how to think about attracting and leveraging foreign direct investment in the digital economy in a way that could help with diversification uh, through growing new activities that heretofore haven't been uh, you know, available and through uh, also providing uh, existing activities in new ways, what uh, Dr. Braga talked about the cross between sectors and within sectors economic diversification in his presentation. So now we've, we've talked so far about the digital. Now I'd like to shift to the other part of our policy brief, the other half, which is about sustainable investment. And I'd also like to argue that both to a large degree should be seen as combined because you can use digital tools to increase sustainability and sustainable uh, economic activities. Think of a firm being able to use digital tools to better source on its supply chain and better be able to track whether what it's, the energy it uses is renewable or not, uh, whether to be able to, to track uh, effectively you know, the package from point A to point B. This is, um, it will help with its bottom line, it will help uh, with efficiency, but it will also help with sustainability as it increases efficiency and perhaps uh, less carbon uh, offset. You know, it, carbon is used in that transportation because digital tools have allowed it to be more efficient in its operations. So, so I really see the two, um, the two agendas as coming together. But what are the levers turning now to sustainable investment? What are the specific levers that we can think about uh, in that space? And that is the second half of our policy brief. We, we suggest that sustainable investment uh, the five the levers can be grouped in five different pillars different categories and you see them here uh, on the slide that there are certain policies specific policies in support of sustainable investment at the same time there needs to be the mobilization of sustainable finance then sustainable investment promotion activities sustainable investment facilitation and this goes, uh, connects with what Dr. Braga said about the importance of the WTO negotiations on a new investment facilitation framework uh, for investment facilitation. And then um, sustainable development impact. What are specific interventions that can ensure that the, these investments actually have a uh, quantifiable development impact for an economy? And here in our policy brief, we try to be very concrete very uh, action oriented. It's easy to, um, I mean, sometimes recommendations can be very generic and then it's difficult for policymakers to land them in practice. So we want it to be quite uh, granular. And we laid out six concrete sustainable investment measures that I would argue um, can uh, at once uh, increase the development impact of investment and also provide tools uh, that can also increase uh, in the diversification of the economy. So the first one would be including international standards in domestic frameworks and international investment agreements. Uh, this uh, is increasingly being done uh, in different economies, um, but there's a lot, the G20 can really accelerate and support this process. And by international standards, uh, we mean things like the um, uh, UN Convention, uh, OECD and the guidelines and the ILO Conventions. These are uh, these can really support clarity for investors to invest uh, in different economies. The second recommendation is to make corporate social responsibility programs 
a requirement for firms above a certain size. Uh, for example, in India, South Africa, they've taken steps in this direction among the G20 economies. Uh, India has made uh, CSR programs are requirements for firms engaged in inward FDI. And South Africa, on the other hand, has made CSR programs recommended but voluntary for South African firms engaged in outward FDI. Third recommendation in our policy brief is to adopt sustainability reporting. Reporting is essential uh, across the ESG uh, metrics for stakeholders to be able to allocate capital according to societal values. And they will be rewarded. Firms that score well will be rewarded with greater investment capital and so on by society. Fourth is the recommendation to align incentives with sustainable behavior of firms. Um, this can be used in the incentives that, uh, that were mentioned earlier, uh, either in the form of a stick, uh, taking them away if behavior is not sustainable or a carrot giving more incentives if investment is carried out in a way that aligns with the sustainable goals of the economy. And then fifth, paying special attention to a sustainable infrastructure of investments because these have long-term implications for the economy, just as Dr. Kijuna mentioned earlier. Then we do a deep dive really into how to support linkages. And here we provide four very specific actions that uh, policymakers may, may wish to take to support linkages between foreign firms and domestic firms. And again, these uh, linkages can support sustainability in the form of you know, um, goals, greater jobs, income, training, and so forth uh, for domestic firms. But I would also say this is can these represent levers for diversification as well, uh, because as you create linkages between a foreign firm and a domestic firm, um, that uh, the contracts, the training, the skills that are transferred through that can help create new business activities, new business lines, uh, existing business lines in new ways. Uh, this is a kind of knowledge transfer that can take place when two companies uh, are working together. So here we have four very specific uh, interventions to support linkages. First, the importance of hard and soft infrastructure for firms uh, to be attracted to that investment climate. Second, the importance of quality certification that can create confidence, market confidence, uh, both quality certification in product and in processes, and which can facilitate partnering uh, between foreign firms and domestic firms. Fourth, supplier development programs which can actively help with matchmaking and matching between foreign and local firms. And fourth, export processing zones. Uh, designing these in a way that they actually don't stay as siloed, don't stay as islands, but are actually connected to the rest of the economy through supportive regulations and through geographic and physical proximity. So, so how to do this in practice, all of the above, how to leverage digital investment, to, to create digital capabilities and also diversification through that route and how to leverage uh, sustainable investment, uh, have sustainable development impact and also in, see to what degree sustainable investment support can uh, be an additional lever to support diversification. How do we do this? Um, in our policy brief, we suggest launching a G20 international investment support program. This support program you'll see uh, in the slide would be divided into two halves. One half that uh, provides a mechanism to bring together and coordinate between the various actors, uh, IOs and other experts who, um, who have capabilities and uh, knowledge in this space so that these various uh, resources are coordinated and aligned precisely to tackle some of the challenges that have been identified to, to support the digital investment and sustainable investment. And then this would be uh, this would be made reality through an investment fund, fund that would provide the capital to do some of the technical assistance and the projects uh, identified as needed by the investment facility. Operationally in practice, this could be 
implemented through creating what we call a global alliance for sustainable investment facilitation. Uh, there is precedent for this in the trade facilitation agreement, which was, is, is currently being successfully implemented through a global alliance for uh, trade facilitation. And this is a mechanism that brings together the public and the private sectors in concrete projects uh, in specific countries. Right now, the global alliance for trade facilitation is in 12 uh, countries. And it really tackles uh, roadblocks, jams to trade uh, on, on, a, on, on, the, on the ground uh, in a way that is quantifiable so that they show that their interventions actually made a difference uh, in terms of cost and time for trade. But we think something very similar could be useful in the area of investment uh, through an alliance that brings together public and private sector actors to identify jams, impediments to digital or sustainable investment, uh, as discussed earlier, and identify specific interventions specific actions that are needed on the ground operationally to tackle the roadblocks, the jams, so to speak, uh, to greater digital and sustainable investment. So we'd replicate a little bit the, the successful model of the previous global alliance with this new global alliance that now focused on investment. Uh, so with that, uh, allow me to thank you for, uh, for the opportunity to share these views, and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you very much, Mr. Stevenson. Indeed, uh, technology has become the name of the game. If you just please allow me to recap, I will go over first the key challenges observed and then the policy recommendations. FDI, the foreign direct investment, is expected to drop between 20, 30 to 40% according to the UNICTAD 2020, as much as economic activity plummets and the world's recession looms close. At the same time, digitization is offering channels of adaptation and new modalities of delivering goods and services. That's number one. Number two is the challenge, therefore, is to restart investment flows in a way that helps firms and societies adapt to the downturn, seizing opportunities of digitization to transform ways of doing businesses, while establishing frameworks to ensure that investment flows Flows make sure uh, make the maximum contribution to sustainable development. For the policy recommendations, a G20 investment facility and fund to facilitate public-private collaboration on investment reforms that increase both the quantity and quality of investment flows. That was number one. Number two, a sustainable investment framework to advance such collaboration through a common language. Number three concrete, actionable investment policies and measures to advance sustainable development. Number five, concrete, actionable investment policies and measures to advance digital development. Number five, creating industry-based coal uh, coalitions as a mechanism to operationalize the above ideas. I hope this captures most of it. Thank you, yes. Thank you so much. And. Um, Distinguished speakers, now we go to the uh, questions. And question number one is for Mr. Braga. Um, the question is, what could be the impact of export restrictions on raw materials and inputs on diversification of developing countries' manufacturing sectors? That question was from Mr. Said Ackman, uh, Task Force Number 1 co-chair to Mr. Braga. Mr. Braga, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. al -Said. Uh Of course, uh, raw materials typically do not face major trade restrictions, but there are some segments that you can see, particularly through uh, uh, quantitative measures, a significant impact in certain segments. In this context, of course, uh, you should, as we discussed in more generic terms, avoid this type of measures. But the one thing that it's very important to highlight, we have been stressing the importance of export diversification. But as I pointed out, it is one of the points made in our brief. 
it's also very important to look at your own national policies and to what extent they create a uh, hindrance to export diversification by imposing import restrictions because our import restrictions in the end are going to create an anti-export bias be it by creating problems for the operations for instance of global value chains access to intermediate inputs and also mineral oil products when there are such restrictions but also through macroeconomic effects through an appreciation of the exchange rate if these import restrictions are quite significant so in my former life as the former director of economic policy and debt of the world bank this was one of the issues that uh, we often analyze with client countries in terms of the implications of their own tariff structure and overall uh, import substitution type of initiatives, including with respect to raw materials. Just to finalize, nowadays in some areas like uh, uh, minerals that are important for the electronics industry, uh, you can see export restrictions that are in the end counterproductive from the point of view of the global trading system. Thank you very much, Mr. Braga. Uh, Dr. Saeed Sheikh, I have a question from my side. In your paper, um, you write about trade agreements and global value chain integration. How have you seen the events of 2020 affect uh, global value chain integration, particularly with the respect to the MENA region? Dr. Saeed, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khalid. So, uh, uh, as you will recall in the beginning of the uh, pandemic, some of the uh, countries of the world made uh, restrictions on especially medical supplies exports and uh, that had encouraged some of the countries within the, within the world to look about uh, restricting or focusing on creating global value chain either within the country or within the region in order to come to overcome that particular issue related to the aspects as some of the countries restricted uh, the uh, supplies of, of medical to other countries and focusing or trying to retain whatever it has to its own population or its own people. Uh, so there is that sort of uh, inward uh, issue that had happened this year in terms of regional in terms of global value chain being retreating to within country or within uh, the region uh, this is, was very particular for example in the united states focusing on, on on doing that especially that we know many of the medical supplies many of medicines are produced for example in china either for political or economic reason that that has been the case but I think this is going to be, uh, you know, a, a limited uh, phenomena that had happened in, in, in 2020 due to the uh, current uh, pandemic crisis. Uh, and, uh, un and it's very unlikely that this sort of phenomena will, will continue uh, in the years to come as this pandemic becomes behind us because competitiveness and, uh, um, uh, of, 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 uh, of certain uh, industries and in certain parts of the world will, will, will dominate and would influence the pattern of trade and the trade of, and its trade as it relates to global value chain. Thank you, Dr. Saeed. Um, Mr. Nodongo, I have this question for you. In your research, you mentioned that between 1998 and 2018, 
more than 70% of Africa's exports to the world comprised fuels and other primary commodities. What's your view? What's your review of economic diversification across the major African economies and how are they expected to fare in 2020 and 2021? Mr. Nadango, or is yours? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. And I, and I think um, the, the, the beauty about this is actually to, to show that actually the incentive mechanism is the one that allows us to move to the next level in terms of innovativeness. And it, it is a question of uh, primary exports have dominated and it's just because individual countries in Africa are just channeling their uh, exports to individual countries across without actually cooperating in terms of how the standards for those products can be made. So it means it, it robs economic diversification. Let me give you an example. Whenever I come to the Middle East or, or uh, an, an LNA part of Middle East, I take very good tea and I always can taste our higher tea. And anytime I ask, it is either from Pakistan or from Egypt. And you can see that uh, many African countries are also doing the same thing. Egypt takes about a third of our tea, raw tea, and Pakistan takes the other third, or almost another third. But essentially, the primary exports have been doing, we have been doing that for ages. In fact, that is even a, a, a diversification because before that it was actually destined to, uh, to Europe, that is to UK, to United Kingdom, which is the English breakfast tea. If you come to the domestic market for tea, let me tell you that it is so difficult even to enter the export market from the Kenyan point of view as a Kenyan producer, because it's contained or controlled by different uh, pressure groups or even interest groups. So the biggest problem here is that it is no, we are not blaming the international uh, uh, trade hoary. We are also blaming our own internal institutional makeup and even governance. It has limited, it has robbed most of the producers that innovativeness for increasing their productivities. That's why I talked about institutional failure program, institutional governments, governance problem. That's why I called it a political economy issue at the domestic level. At the international level, then we also need to come up and say, how do we reform and restructure the global value chain mechanism? Because essentially, it is, a, it is an incentive we are looking at. We are looking at an incentive that allows endogenous growth as well as international trade flows. And this can be agreeable. It is a question of how do we reinvest in that particular sector? If you go back to the history, if oil producing countries did not join up to, to form OPEC and also create standards, then obviously I don't know where it would be in the world in terms of looking at the cost of oil the reinvestment, the heavy investment in producing uh, fossil fuels and all that. If you can see that it is an endogenous mechanism that requires strict governance. It requires incentive mechanism. It requires endogenous uh, understanding and even growth. And finally, it also requires an international framework of standards, incentives. And uh, obviously that is where diversification will come in. Economic diversification and even transformation will rely very much on the incentives we create, either endogenous or international. And that is the point I'm making. And this is why we have remained on this. In fact, uh, Dr. Kared, you summarized how much e e exports in Africa, that in, in terms of world exports, in total exports from Africa to the rest of the world has not changed. In, in actual fact, it has, it has been declining. And that is where the problem starts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ndongo. Mr. Stephenson, this is the last question. Let me just give an introduction before the question I give it to you. The future of money under the new digital economy is demanding new automated and efficient financial systems, especially when it comes to the method of payments, which has become acute over the last decade. New digital currencies such as Bitcoin and Libra by Facebook are testing a lot of the assumptions that we have had about the store of value, money supply, units of exchange and fun functionality, and who performs and what in the system, especially with the um, G5 network is coming along in different parts of the world. A regional example is the uh, Central Bank of Saudi Arabia just partnered with the Central Bank of uh, United Arab Emirates to test some of the uh, cross-border um, digital currency transactions. Now. 
how can we ensure that uh, the question is that I just received from one of the audience is that um, uh, in your opinion, do you perceive achieving sustainability in a very dynamic era with the emergence of disruptive technologies that may face challenges in, in being accepted by the public due to the lack of privacy and to provide for business institutions such as blockchains technology, which offers increased transparency and efficiency, but lacks transparency. Um, to you, uh, Mr. Stevenson. Well, that's a complicated question. I, I suppose you, you kept the most complicated for the end. Let me let me give it a shot. Uh, I, I I will mention that we uh, we do have a digital payments uh, work stream um, as part of the digital trade work that we do. Uh, uh, digital trade is seen as uh, data flows, the importance of managing data soundly, uh, uh, digital payments, you know, you can't, without digital payments, it, it can't be effective, uh, and, and technologies and how technologies uh, can be integrated. So, so I'm a little familiar with the, the importance of digital payments. Um, let me just say a couple of thoughts, a couple of reactions. I think the one key element that, that is always uh, raised is the importance of interoperability of different payment systems um, and different systems in general. And so for the uh, two central banks to be coordinating, um, you know, clearly it creates interoperability uh, uh, between their different systems um, on, these, on these new technologies. The other one uh, is trust. Um, trust that these technologies will be used and, and rolled out in a way that is understood by the people and, uh, you know, where the development impact will be sound and so forth. So I think that is really where the policy frameworks come into place to ensure that the regulators put in place the systems that are trusted, uh, that the block, blockchain, artificial intelligence, and so forth are rolled out in, in, in ways uh, that align with you know, society's goals. So I guess those would be the, the two reactions uh, to sort of meta elements to make sure that these payments and other uh, technological solutions are rolled out uh, in a way that we, we wish to really see for all of society. Thank you very much, Mr. Stevenson. And this concludes our webinar. Thank you very much all. Uh, Mr. Carlos Braga, Dr. Saeed Sheikh, Mr. Uh, Nogona Nodungu, Mr. Matthew Stevenson, and finally, Mr. Abdullah uh, Darandiri. Thank you so much all for your uh, participation, for your valuable papers. Highly appreciated, uh, and thank you all. Thank you. This concludes our webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for being so Thank good you. in terms of managing time. Thank you very much. Good Pleasure. presentation. Thank you. Thank you Stay very much. safe.